So to help try and clear up the kind of mental model of Ethereum and how this works, I thought let's uh, just consider an actual example and then we'll walk through the Ethereum, um, the Ethereum protocol with this example in, in place. So an actual decentralized app, as they're called, or smart contract, they're, they're also called, I'll, I'll denote it as a decentralized app. or DAP for short. Um, okay, so this is a very, very simple DAP, kind of like the hello world of Ethereum, if you will. Um, this is a DAP that's written in a language uh, called Solidity, which we mentioned last time. And so it's a, a sort of high level language. We'll talk We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but let's, let's just try and understand it and then we'll walk through where does this code come from? Where does it go? Who are the people that are involved in, in putting the code up and all of that type of stuff, okay? Um, this you can ignore for now. It's just sort of uh, a, a declaration of version numbers uh, for, for what code was used. Um, and so the main body of the code is we have a contract, okay? And so the contract is going to be everything that's defined here. And if you're familiar with well, Java ideally, but even any kind of object-oriented programming language, contracts are essentially objects. They, they kind of have the same properties. Um, so I'll, I'll just note that this is a kind of object, okay? Uh, the object has a name, simple storage. Okay, inside the object, we have, uh, just, just like any object-oriented programming, um, you have a few things. Uh, so one thing that you're going to have is uh, you're going to have some variables to store things. Okay, so these are variables. Okay, and in this case, we just have an integer. Uint stands for unsigned integer. Okay, so all this smart contract is going to do is it's basically just going to store an integer uh, called stored, stored data. Okay, then what we're going to do is we're going to find some methods. Uh, so we have two methods here. Uh, one's called set. You pass in a new integer and it overwrites uh, whatever's stored in this integer with the new integer. Okay, so it's a, what we call a setter function. And then we have a method called get and get uh, will return uh, the, the actual object itself. It doesn't take any parameters itself. Um, and it's going to just return out uh, the uint. Now this notation looks a little weird. Uh, normally we're, we're maybe used to things like public and private uh, being at the start. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that the return type um, is denoted here. So very typically in, for example, Java, uh, the syntax would, would have the return type uh, before the method name. Um, so, so these are just syntax, syntax issues and uh, constant we'll, we'll talk about later. You can just sort of ignore that for now, okay? And why we even get a getter, why we even need a get function is also something that we're going to revisit that if you know a little bit about Ethereum, you might be confused about uh, because everything on uh, blockchain is, is already public information. But anyways, okay, so this is our contract. Now, there's one other method that's almost always included in a smart contract that's not included here. So a, a, a better example would include it, and that's some sort of constructor. Uh, so a constructor would, um, would run the very first time uh, this contract is created, and it would push uh, whatever, basically whatever initial values you want uh, for your state uh, into the state of the contract itself, okay? Um, so anyways, we, we don't have a, a constructor in this case, but let's just proceed without it. Okay, so this is our, our smart contract. Okay, so who, who makes this? So let's assume that some user wants to put this up on a blockchain. We don't know why, because we don't really know what the blockchain is doing for us yet. But anyways, let's call this user Alice. So Alice is here and this is her smart contract and she really wants to put this on Ethereum. Okay, so what do we know about Alice? Well, the first thing is that Alice herself needs to have an Ethereum address. Okay, so she'll have 
uh, her own, maybe multiple, but she'll have at least one uh, Ethereum address as well as the corresponding uh, signing key, just like in Bitcoin. Okay, and this is independent of the contract. Before she, she even writes a first line of this contract, she has some address. And this address, just like in Bitcoin, it can hold uh, the currency of Ethereum, uh, which is called Ether, or I'll just denote it as ETH, okay? So it will have a certain balance of Ethereum that's associated with it. How did she get it in the first place? Well, she mined it, or she was given it, or she purchased it through an exchange service, something like that, we're not sure, but uh, somehow she, she was able to obtain some Ethereum, and so she's sitting here with this Ethereum at her address, okay? Now, in Ethereum, uh, there are different kinds of addresses. And so uh, this is the one type of address which is owned by an individual. It's a very simple address that, that basically only holds Ethereum, okay? Contracts or dApps have their own addresses. Uh, we'll talk about how they're assigned in a second, but they're distinct uh, from these addresses, these simple addresses that are held by users, okay? So then what Alice says is, hey, I have this, uh, this dApp, I want it put onto the blockchain. Um, so what she's going to do is she's going to take her dApp, which is called Simple Storage. Uh, it's currently Solidity, so I'll just denote that as .sol. And what she'll do is she's going to compile it down. So Ethereum doesn't actually understand Solidity. Uh, it stores a sort of assembly language version of it. Uh, so she's going to compile it. Um, and Solidity, even though it's it's not stored directly on the blockchain, it is very well supported by Ethereum. So even if you have the basic Ethereum wallet, it's going to have a Solidity compiler just built into it. So if you want to deploy a smart contract, you can copy and paste your Solidity code into it, and I'll show you this. Um, and it will compile it, it will do some basic debugging and, and things like that for you, okay? Uh, then what we get is we get out uh, some, uh, well, we'll get out simple storage and it will be in uh, a sort of assembly style language. Uh, and it's called, uh, EVM is the, it's called the uh, Ethereum virtual machine. And so this is sort of the, you know, usually when you have assembly, you, you compile it for a specific platform. So the platform that you're compiling it for is just called the Ethereum virtual machine. This is similar to the Java virtual machine if you use Java and uh, EVM. So, so this assembly is, is usually called EVM code. Okay, but it's basically a low level representation of that contract. And, I'll certainly show you what that looks like uh, in a little bit. Okay, so now we have this uh, byte code. Okay, and then this is what she's going to push to the Ethereum blockchain. Okay, and what is the blockchain going to do when it receives this code? What it's going to do is it's going to take this code, it's going to look at it, uh, and the very first time when she pushes it, what it will do is it will go find the constructor if, if one exists. Uh, so this code doesn't have a constructor, uh, but if it had a constructor, it would go grab the constructor and it would run it and it would update all of these variables to whatever uh, the current state is. So here, uh, stored data is going to not contain any value until this is run for the very first time, until this set function is run uh, for the very first time. Uh, so it's going to be initially uninitialized. Um, but anyways, that's just the way that this code happens to be written. But what the miners are going to do is they're going to take the code, um, they're going to look at it, they're going to run the constructor, and then they're going to store uh, something about the contract. Okay. So what they'll do is they're going to create a new address. And this address is going to be unique for this DAP. So simple storage, when it gets put on the blockchain, will be given an address 
uh, by the by the blockchain. It's it's actually computed, so given's maybe the wrong term, but anyways, it's going to have its own address. So at the end of this, Alice has her address where she holds her ether, and now there's a new address that holds this decentralized app. Okay, it's a totally different address. Okay, so it's going to have an address. Um, it's going to store the code itself. So this assembly level code, it's going to be stored directly at this address. So if you go look up this address, you'll see, oh, here's the code. Uh, and so the code includes all the functions and it's also going to store the current state. And so this, in this case, current state sounds a little ambiguous, uh, but current state would be basically what's this variable, this uint signed to right now. Okay, so as you imagine over time, uh, different people might set it to different values. So what's the current value that's stored in this particular variable? Okay, uh, so the current state right now is there's this variable, it's called stored data. It's called stored data in Solidity. Once you compile it down, that, that label is going to disappear. Um, but Ethereum also allows you to sort of attach uh, kind of meta information about your code uh, so that, that things like label, labels for variable names and things like that can be preserved. This is sort of a, a, a nuance that don't, don't worry if you don't follow that. Um, but anyways, uh, so stored data is currently uninitialized and, and that's it. Um, so there's, there's, no, there's no other state uh, in it, okay? So this is the current state of the function. Now, once this uh, function is up and it's stored at this address, uh, then what people can do is they can come along and they can run these functions. So they basically say, hey, I want to run set on uh, the contract that's stored at this particular address. I would like to run it and I'm going to give you an input uh, to the function, which will be a uint. Uh, it will be a number like 8888. And uh, once that function is run, um, then the state will get updated so that stored data points at 88888. Okay, now before we get there, there's one other key thing that I want to I wanna denote. Uh, and that is that this stuff doesn't happen for free. So we have Alice, she has an address, she has some ether uh, that's sitting at this address. Uh, taking her code and compiling it down is something she does on her machine. Okay, so this is all local to Alice. Okay, so all of this stuff happens on Alice's computer. But when she pushes this code to the blockchain, what she's going to do is she's going to pay for it, okay? And she's going to push some money and the blockchain will basically only do this, this work of sending an address for it, storing the code and, and executing the, the constructor if there is one and updating the current state. It's only going to do this work uh, if there's a payment that's made for doing it, okay? Now the payment takes the form of something we call gas. And um, uh, this, this denote this like you need we need to spend a little bit of time talking a bit about gas and, and what exactly it is okay so the key idea is users pay for dApps to prevent denial of service attacks because if Computations were free. Um, I didn't emphasize this enough, but let me let me re-emphasize it. That um, when somebody in the blockchain does this work of picking an address, storing the code, and storing the the current state, all the other nodes on the blockchain have to do the same work too, and make sure that they get the same outcome. Okay, so it's just like in Bitcoin, where uh, one node is the the miner is is actually doing the initial work and they're proposing it in a block, but all the other miners are going to verify that it was done correctly before they build on that block. Um, so every little bit of work 
that you ask the Ethereum blockchain to do, it, every miner on the network has to do that work. Okay, so it's very expensive. Um, and so if you want to bring down the Ethereum network, what you could do is you could ask it to, you know, for example, execute an infinite loop and then it would loop forever uh, and then all the nodes would, would eventually terminate. Okay, um, so the key idea is that we're going to get users to pay for it. So if, if you want them to execute an infinite loop, uh, you're going to have to pay for that to happen. And there'll be some bounds on it to, to stop you from, from paying for that to happen, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Okay. Uh, so the first question is, is uh, how how are they going to pay? Are they going to pay in Canadian dollars, US dollars? Well, no, this is a, a cryptocurrency. Um, we have Ethereum, uh, or Ether, sorry, which is the, the onboard currency for Ethereum. And so uh, users can pay in Ether, okay? Uh, the next question is how much? And so what we're going to do is, um, Okay, this, this is where it gets uh, sort of complicated, but basically what's going to happen is um, you're going to assemble your code into bytecode and every operation uh, in that bytecode has a certain cost. So you have a bunch of really primitive operations and each of them has a price and this price is just set uh, by you know, the people who make Ethereum. Okay, so there's, there's a, somewhere you can look up a document that tells you how much uh, every operation costs. Okay, so every operation has a fixed cost. And then you just run it. Okay, and there is an issue where um, you um, so let me let me say this slightly different. What Alice can do is uh, she can she has to figure out how much she has to pay. So what she's going to do is she can look at her code, but it's not a question of how much code is there. It's it's what executes. Like for example, if there's a loop, the same uh, couple commands might might execute five times or ten times or a hundred times, right? So it's not just a matter of looking at the code. You have to actually execute it to see how long that execution takes. Okay, so what she'll do is she'll execute it herself. She'll see how many operations she did, what those exact operations were, and how much that cost. Okay, and so she'll know how much it costs uh, to execute it before she even sends it to the network. Now, there are ways of writing contracts that this contract is not an example of, but there are complicated ways of writing contracts where uh, if somebody else other than Alice runs it, it might take a different execution path. So you have to be, um, you know, well, a simple example of this would be, um, let's say that you, you had some data structure that was storing some information. And uh, what you do is you wanna modify the information. Um, so you, you ask yourself, how much is it gonna to cost to modify the information? But before you have a chance to broadcast that transaction, let's say somebody else uh, runs a function that doubles the size of that, okay? Now the amount of money in order to uh, fetch uh, something from that data structure is, is going to be more expensive because it's a bigger data structure and we're going to assume that, that you have to search through it or something like that. You can't just jump to uh, what you want immediately, okay? So that's an example where by the time it leaves your computer and it ends up in the blockchain, the price might change because the, the actual execution path itself will change, okay? But in lots of simple examples, basically you, you can get an exact estimate of how much this is going to cost, okay? Um, so each operation has a fixed cost. Uh, you can check which operations will run locally. And so your, your thing will do this before broadcasting. And uh, the problem is, okay, issue, this might change. There's also ways of, you know, for example, you can code up who the miner is that mines and, and maybe you take one execution path if they, you know, there, there's all sorts of contracts that you could write that, that aren't very common in practice, but anyways, would, would result in you not being able to predict exactly how long it's going to take. 
Okay. Um, so what uh, Ethereum wallets will do is they'll say, uh, give us like a, an upper limit on how much gas. They'll say, we just ran your operation. It took uh, this amount. Uh, this, this is how much it will cost. Uh, we suggest that, that maybe you pledge double that amount uh, so that if it ends up taking longer, uh, then, then it will still execute to completion. Um, and then uh, if it doesn't take that long, like if it takes the same amount of time, the amount that you pay is, is not how much you pledge, it's how much was actually used, right? So, um, you know, if it has a certain cost, uh, you say you can spend up to a certain amount, uh, but, but you'll actually only pay for, for what it actually costs, okay? Um, so you, and I'll show you the whole user interface for this, and, and so we'll circle back to this issue as well, but, um, okay, so the issue is that it might change uh, how long, how many operations it will take, and so the idea is that you'll uh, provide up to a certain amount of payment uh, and it will cost what is actually used. Okay, one last thing, uh, and you might be wondering, I called it gas here, and here we're talking about ether, what's the difference between gas and ether? Okay, so the key idea is we're going to pay, we're going to pay in ether, we can figure out how much it's going to cost, and we're basically going to pay uh, for every operation. The final thing is that um, ether, uh, so by the time Ethereum came out, uh, people had learned a lesson from Bitcoin, which is that Bitcoin's price is highly volatile. Uh, so there's no reason to expect that Ether wouldn't also be volatile. And so the problem is if you say, uh, let's say an AND operation, you know, it, it costs, you know, 0.001 Ether or whatever the case may be, and then the price of Ether doubles or it goes up by 10 or it goes up by 100, then the actual cost of running this operation also goes up by 10 or it goes up by 100. Okay, so it seemed really difficult to... Um, Unless if Ether was a stable currency, it seems very difficult to have to, to, to price uh, the costs of these operations, okay? So instead, this is a, a level of abstraction and indirection that makes Ethereum a little confusing, uh, but instead of paying in Ether, what we do is we pay in a, a kind of fictitious currency. we pay in, uh, so the fictitious currency is called gas, okay? And so everything will have a certain price in terms of gas. Uh, so when you look up that document that I suggested that, that tells you how much every operation, it it's in terms of gas. Uh, and then what you do is uh, you say, for every amount of gas, I'm willing to pay one ether for that, or two ether for that, or 10 ether. Usually it's, it's fractions of ethers, but you basically quote uh, how much ether you're willing to pay for, how, much, how many units of ether you're willing to pay uh, for gas. And that's something that you decide as a user. So you decide that. And what will happen is the miners will look at it and they'll say, oh, you're paying a lot uh, for it therefore we'll actually run your code or you're not paying enough uh, for your gas so we're not going to run your code or we're going to put it at the end of the line and you know if, if, if there's not enough other transactions to run then maybe we'll run yours, okay? So what ends up happening is this gas mechanism is basically, it's kind of like a fee or it's kind of like an auction where you're bidding, you're saying how much you're willing to pay uh, and so, um, you know, as the market changes, for example, as the price of Ether goes up or down, uh, you might pay different amounts, okay? So you might think of this computation in sort of real world dollars, right? So uh, you might pay a dollar for this operation and then if the price of Ether doubles, instead of paying $2, you would just lower how much gas, uh, how much Ether you're paying per unit of gas uh, so that um, it still costs a dollar, okay? Um, and so anyway, so this is a way of, of isolating 
uh, the end user from the fluctuations in the dollar of the ether. Okay, so we pay in gas uh, and we quote how much ether we pay per gas. Okay, so this is almost equivalent to you saying, hey, I have this function to run and this is how much I want to pay you. And then miners can take it or leave it. Uh, that would be a much simpler way of doing it. Uh, by using gas, it just, uh, it kind of, it helps standardize uh, how much you should pay. It helps give you an indication of how much you should be paying for a contract because every operation is, is priced out in terms of gas itself. Um, and it also makes it easier for uh, the people receiving uh, the contract, uh, the people on the network, they can uh, just look at this, uh, how much, they don't have to look at two contracts and say, okay, this one's paying $5, this one's paying $10, but this one seems more complicated or less complicated. They don't have to do that. They can just look at, at uh, how much you're willing to pay for your gas and then they can sort all the contracts, you know, based on who's paying the most to who's paying the least and then they can execute them and figure out how much it's actually going to cost. Um, so anyway, so, so this is sort of a, a, you know, this makes this kind of complicated, especially for, for a class in terms of teaching it. Uh, but in terms of real world, um, uh, real world applicability, it's actually a really clever idea. And it's one that, that, that um, just saves uh, Ethereum from, from having to deal with a bunch of economic issues that have nothing to do with the uh, technical issues themselves.